Good morning and welcome to Lighthouse Church. Thank you for joining us this morning. We trust that you're going to have an amazing time with us. We're still doing everything a little bit differently, but we're bringing a little bit of the Lighthouse Church feel back to your homes. So with stage three, we get to change things a little bit and we get to have a fuller worship team. And I get to greet you and I get to preach from Lighthouse Church this morning. So it's a great honor that uh, you've chosen to come and hear the Word of God and, and just join us for ministry. Normally on a Sunday morning, I'd ask, if you're here for the very first time, would you please raise your hand? Perhaps you watching or listening to this recording for the very first time, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love it if you sent us an email or even commented now on Facebook or sent us a message on our WhatsApp number. It's at the bottom of the screen. It'd be great to hear from you. For those of you that Lighthouse Church has been your home for since before the lockdown, thanks for joining us again. We trust that this morning is going to be an opportunity for you to have an encounter with Jesus, a moment with the Holy Spirit, as God our Father just lavishes you with His love. I'm going to open in prayer and we're going to go into a time of worship. If you join me, just Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. And we pray, Lord God, that you will have your way with us. Lord, we submit this meeting to you. We submit our will to you. Jesus. Father, Holy Spirit, come and receive the glory and the worship and the honor that is all yours. You're worthy to be praised. So we bless your holy name. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Your name lifted high, oh God. You have 
worthy of all our glory, of all our praise. Any, anything that's in you right now that wants to bubble out and just declare His goodness. So Lord God, we declare that you're worthy of it all. We submit to you and we declare this morning that you are worthy to receive all honor and praise. And we thank you this morning for your goodness and your kindness that is so evident in our lives. This week, one of our leaders had this prophetic word and it was, she woke up with, this, uh, with a sense of God saying and speaking to her about CPR. And the CPR that he was speaking to her about is he wants to blow Fresh, fresh in our lives. He wants to blow life into our character, into our perseverance, and into our ability to receive. And God wants to do a work in our lives, and He wants to do a work through you. And in this time, He wants to work on your character. Things that need adjustment. He wants you to understand that He wants you to persevere. And He also wants you to learn how to receive what He has for you. Perhaps you're going through an exceptionally difficult time. Perhaps this is the hardest season you've ever had to face. If you're in Jesus, I promise you it's worth it. We read this in the book of Romans. As Paul writes to the Roman church and has written to us, it's this, Romans 8 verse 18, reading from the Passion Translation, it says this, I am convinced that any suffering we endure is less than nothing compared to the magnitude of glory that is about to be unveiled within us. <laughs> that nothing we have gone through or what we will go through is compared to what will be revealed to us and through us. So I'm going to pray with you this morning. Lord, as you work on our character, as you work, as we work on our perseverance, as you touch our character, I pray, Lord, that we will receive whatever it is that you have for us, whatever we need to learn, whatever we need to understand. Lord, I pray that you work in our hearts and in our lives, that nothing will be wasted, that we can settle in our hearts, that what we are going through now is nothing compared to the glory that awaits the sons and daughters of the Most High. Lord, I pray, breathe your life over every single person listening right now. Just breathe over them, Lord. I speak over everyone that feels as though they're being suffocated, as though they're being drowned, as they don't know which is up and which way is sideways, as they've been overwhelmed by the challenges, whether it's financial, whether it's health, whether it's just processing how do I how to get our kids through school. The ups and downs, Lord, I pray your life to be breathed over them. Holy Spirit, you to be breathed into us. Just a refreshing. 
not to push us into the next season, but to catapult us into the calling that you have for us. Lord, I pray for every person that has just been challenged to their limits. I pray for a renewal, a refreshing. In Jesus' name, amen. As we get ready to go into the Word, we just have a few announcements we'd like to highlight. But I want to encourage you before we do that, just if you're feeling swamped, if you're feeling overwhelmed, please reach out to someone, make a phone call, call the office, call the church. We have counselors who'd love to meet with you, love to chat with you. We can do that at this stage. If you're feeling absolutely overwhelmed, you're feeling as though you, you're trying to wade through concrete, I want to encourage you that God has an extraordinary plan. And in this mess, God has not created the mess, but God can use the mess. No matter what it is that you're facing, regardless of the situation, God can work with it if you'd surrender to Him. Please don't think for a second that any of this has been wasted. Don't think for a second your life isn't of incredible purpose. As Heinz said last week in his preach, the Lord wouldn't place himself, the Holy Spirit, in vessels that are worthless, but he treasures you and loves you. And we believe that firmly. But let's see what's happening in the life of the church in this season. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Lighthouse Church. We are so glad that you've decided to spend a part of your weekend with us. Before we hear the word, here are a few things to take note of. On Tuesday and Thursday nights at 6.30, we have our Zoom prayer meetings. And on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m., we have our life groups, also on Zoom. For more information, please contact us on WhatsApp or on email at admin at lighthousechurch.co.za. Have a great day, Lighthouse Church. Good morning and thank you for joining us. Um, I'm speaking to you. Thank you for joining us on Facebook, YouTube, whatever platform you've chosen. And obviously to my small mini congregation that I get to have for a change now that we can have meetings back at the church. Uh, less than 50, we get together and all of you with your face masks on, those that have their face masks on, um, we'll, uh, yeah, we are, I, I trust we're going to have a great time this morning as I share the word. We're still in Ecclesiastes. I'm going to open in prayer, and uh, we're going to see what God has to say. So, Heavenly Father, I thank you for your goodness and your kindness that is so evident. I thank you that you've blessed us so abundantly, Lord. I thank you for your goodness, Lord, that is shown through Jesus Christ who gave himself for us. So, Lord, I pray... A blessing this morning as I read your word. I pray that your word will be a blessing in our homes, a blessing to us. It will be food for our souls and our spirits and will even impact our bodies. I pray this in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. We're in, as I said, uh, in Ecclesiastes. Uh, it's the eighth installment of, uh, of the series. And for the last six chapters that we've worked through, everything has been about... It's kind of Solomon bemoaning, and it's, it's, it's this whole diagnostic of what's wrong with us. The diagnostic of why life is meaningless. The diagnostic as to why life is pointless. The diagnostic as why there's no point to life under the sun. Obviously, we know there's, point to, there's a point to life in Christ Jesus. It's kind of like just diagnostics. Now, imagine if that's all we had. We had diagnostics. You'd go to the doctors. They'd say, oh, you have a broken arm. All the best. Or, oh, you have a screw stuck in your head. See how that works out for you. Medicine exists, or that's, that medical science exists because we have diagnostics and then we have remedy, the therapeutics. And that's what happens from this point on in Ecclesiastes. We shift from being just diagnostics where we're going, this is why it's a mess, to now how do we remedy this? So it's more exciting as far as after having spent so many weeks going, this is the problem with life, this is our shortcomings, this, these are the challenges, and our challenges being real, we now get to that point where we go, actually, this is the secret to having life count. And, and Solomon highlights seven key things. Today he speaks to us seven key things of what we do and how we can behave and what we can start focusing on uh, to allow our, our lives to start having purpose and meaning again. And it's, it's built around one thing, wisdom. It's the one thing that Solomon desperately desired when God said, you'll be the leader of my people. Name one thing that you desire. He didn't ask for riches, he didn't ask for anything, he asked for wisdom that he may lead the people well. That should be the prayer of every leader. 
especially you know, leaders in churches, we need to have wisdom. And Solomon speaks about wisdom, and something that wisdom encourages us to do is wisdom encourages us to look beyond the now. Wisdom encourages us not to focus on your current situation, but to look beyond. We used to meet in a school hall, a wonderful junior school year in Secunda, and their, their, their catchphrase, their logo was look beyond. And in their hall, it was often during worship, and I'd look up, and it had this, this slogan there, look beyond. And, and as I was preparing this, I thought, that's the reality. We've got to live with our minds in the future. Now, Jesus says, even the sparrows of the, you know, don't worry about tomorrow. They're taken care of. They know the Heavenly Father will take care of them. But it's, it's not about having fear of tomorrow. It's about planning for tomorrow. So as we look at this, I want us to have the understanding that as we look beyond to that we start being people that, and I, it's often a problem with leaders in countries who just want to do something for themselves while they in office, as opposed to extraordinary leaders who look beyond and go, this is how we need the future to look, so this is what I have to do today. Nobody goes to grade one in school and then finishes grade one thinking they've accomplished the end goal. You work all the way to grade 12, and then, then you realize, oh my gosh, I've achieved nothing. And all the grade 12s that are preparing for this year, we bless you, we trust that uh, the next six months of preparation will be like loaves and fish in the hands of Jesus will be multiplied, and you'll do exceptionally well. But the harsh reality is next year, there's more for you to do, and we've always got to be looking into the future. Before I get started with this, I want to do a, I want to do a quick survey. Don't put your hands up. Uh, it's going to be scored out of five, so there are five questions. Um, so I'm going to ask you what you prefer, and you, you know, in your mind you choose which one, and you'll get zero for one answer and one point for the other. So if I ask you, what is better, laughter for no points or crying for one point? What do you prefer? Do you prefer parties or funerals? Parties is zero points, funerals is one point. What's better, your birthday or the day of your burial? Your birthday being zero, and, your, and I'm not saying the high school wins, I'm just saying a way to tally, and your burial day is worth one point, what do you prefer? Compliments? Zero. Or criticism? Complaints? We'll give you one point. Do you enjoy shortcuts, the easiest way? Or do you like the long way around? Shortcuts being zero and the long way around being one. Tally up your scores. Take a moment. The reality is if you've got one or more, you're actually on your way to becoming wise. According to Solomon, if you've got five out of five, well, you don't, you're just lying. Solomon teaches us a couple of key things today. And I'm trusting that after I've shared what the Word of God has spoken to us, that there's something about your life that will make more sense, you'll get to know the point of life, and something's going to be simpler. So I'll click off with the first one. It's in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 1. It says, A good name is better than fine perfume, and the day of death better than the day of birth. Alexander the Great, uh, incredible general, he's walking, he's a, the commander of an army, and he's walking and he comes up to a, a soldier, and the soldier is standing sentry, standing at his post, and he's dozed off. And there's something that you learn to do when you have to do something and you're not allowed to sleep, and it's 48 hours later, and you, you can sleep in almost any position just for these power naps. And the sentry has dozed off. And Alexander the Great stands in front of him. <clears throat> Guy opens his eyes, straightens himself up. Alexander says to him, your name. So the soldier, thinking, well, obviously he's winning on some level, says, Alexander. And Alexander the Great looks at him and goes, you change your name or you change your attitude. You change who you are. But you cannot have both. There's something that's biblical about this. We've got to learn how to preserve our name. Our names have to mean something. It's about reputation. People love quoting Jesus saying, well, Jesus never preserved his reputation. In heaven, he did. With the one who counted, our heavenly Father, he did. He never sinned. But we want to protect our reputation with man and throw it away in the spiritual realm because of our behavior and our thoughts and our actions. I'll get, more, I'll get into that as well. There's something about our name, and I'm talking about your name, your, your surname has to mean something. I have an extremely unusual surname. There are not many of us in the world, um, 
And there happens to be two Derek Chester Browns, and he's my cousin, and we're very different, and uh, one's awesome, and he isn't. And uh, I say that, <laughs> he's a cool guy. Um, but you've got to look after your name, and when you have an unusual name, when I was growing up, if I made nonsense, everyone would know about it, because it's Chester Brown. And for those of you who call me Brown, I'm not a color. Chester Brown, it's something else more than a color. But the thing about looking after your name, and I believe this is the life we should live, this is the attitude we should have, is the life I'm leading now, the life I'm showing to my children, will they proudly stand up and go, that's my dad. No, that's my mom. I'm proud to be associated with them. That, I want to grow up to be. And I'm not talking about your four-year-old because they want to be a fire truck one day. I'm talking about, I watch his character, I watch his behavior, I watch his attitude, I watch his habits, I watch her mannerisms, I watch the way she deals with dad, I watch the way she's a wife. And that's who I want to be. Are we preserving our name as far as our children having legacy? Are we so preoccupied with trying to portray something to our friends about who we are that we... We, we treat our families with disrespect. And I've seen this happen too often, for me not to say this, but often we dishonor our wives when we're around our friends because we want to be funny or we want to get away with it. Your children, your son is looking at you going, there's something wrong. And if he isn't, you're raising him poorly as well. But we need to learn how to protect our names so that our names represent something of honor. Uh, in, in my family, it became something, we don't do that. That's not who we are. It's how I was raised, and for most of my life, I lived a life where I think my dad would have disowned me if he had known the truth. But in reality, he had, he had seen a side of me, which I'd allowed him to see. It was all fake when I was living an absolute disastrous life. But I live a life exposed now to my family, where they go, I want my children to say, that's who I want to be like. The good stuff. Obviously, the bad stuff, <laughs> I teach them better. But are we preserving our name? And it says the name is better than precious perfume. Now, perfume is not the kind of, in those days, it's not the stuff you'd go to whatever shop, a Red Square, and go and buy. It would be something that would be processed, and it was so expensive. We know about that story of Jesus when they, the, the, the woman breaks the alabaster jar of perfume over his feet. That something that she could hold in her hands was worth a year's salary. Um, so she trades a year's salary to worship Jesus, where Judas trades the price of a slave to betray Jesus. She goes, yeah, this is how, this is how I value Jesus. It's this expensive perfume. Scripture speaks about your name is more valuable than expensive perfume. The reason for that being is perfume is something on the outside that makes you smell nice when the inside might be stinking. A name is something that no matter what you smell like on the outside, the character on the inside is something worth having, and that's what we display. We talk about first impressions. When you meet someone, you walk into a room, there might be a nice aroma, and you go, there's something, the person smells nice. I, I enjoy nice odors. We, we had an incident at the church, not in the church, not because of the church, and one of our neighbors, the sewer pipe is blocked, and you'd walk in here and you'd go, demon. Now they're remedying it. The first impression is, I don't want to be here. When it smells nice and fragrant, but that's just the first impression. That's not the building. Your first impression that you're giving people, that's not who you are if all you are is a nice smelling little perfume. It's your character. It's who you are. I've walked past, you know, it's, it's, it's crazy when you're fasting. You can walk past anything. They can be cooking a, a, a rat on the side of the road and you catch the smell, not the burnt hair, but the smell of the meat. And, you start salivating and he's hungry and you think, oh, it'll taste so amazing. And then when you see it, you realize there's a problem and all of a sudden you realize fasting is not a bad idea. But uh, there's some restaurants in our area and some of them are not great, like in any place. But when you walk in there, there's this incredible aroma. There's a steak, something being seared in the background and it doesn't smell great. I mean, it smells amazing, but then you get it and it's not that great. That's kind of like character. People might smell something, but what they get is different. The word says it's more important that what's inside of you is what defines you as opposed to what you put on the outside that you're trying to impress others with. Is your name being preserved? By the way, we have an incredible restaurant in Secunda. If you ever visit, I'll take you there. And um, not to everyone. That's not an open invitation. Uh, maybe for those that are sitting here. And it's funny, when you walk past there, there's actually no smell of what's happening in the kitchen. They're getting the job done. And the, the, the food they serve is just incredible. They're not worried about the smell. They're worried about what's being served. 
are we behaving in such a way? Do you want to add purpose to your life? Make sure that your character is beyond reproach. Don't worry about the smell. Second point. It's better to go to a house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting. For death is the destiny of everyone. The living should take this to heart. Um, there's, a, there's a tribal saying that says, At your birth you cried, everyone else rejoiced. At your death, Everyone else cried, but if you've lived according to God's purpose, you rejoiced. That's what it's supposed to be. It's, we want to go to parties. I, I, don't, I don't like going to funerals. I like, don't like doing funerals. We do them out of duty to honor those that, have left, or that are left behind. I don't like doing it because it represents death. But it's been told to us here very clearly that the day of your death is more valuable than the day of your birth and is now saying that we should rather be in places where there's mourning than this perpetual feasting. It took me a while to get my head around and spending time and just asking God, so what are the details around this? When there's feasting, have you ever gone to a party and it's just lacquer? It's just everyone's having fun and everyone's doing their thing and I'm hoping you're not getting too drunk and the lockdown on booze has ended. Alcohol has got more freedom than I have. And we, we, I hope you're not preoccupied with that being the focus in your life. And you go to these parties and everyone's happy. You're of no value. If you're there or you're not there, they're going to have a festivity. But when you go to a place where there's sadness and there's mourning and there's heartache, you get to make a difference. You get to be light. You get to be salt, as we call to be. Jesus has challenged us to be light. So you go to a dark environment. We know we, we speak about darkness as a place of sin and depravity. But darkness can be a place of sadness. It can be a place of where there's mourning. And we get to go there. We have incredible people in Lighthouse Church that as lockdown hit, people were being called. Have you paid your rent? Are you, are you, you know, managing to buy groceries? Are you going to survive? As soon as there was a place where there was a potential for mourning, the people kicked into gear. Now, we know how to celebrate. We know how to feast together. But the Word says, if your life starts becoming based purely on the party, go and read Ecclesiastes 1-6, to because it says there it's meaningless. Solomon suddenly has this revelation. He says, if you're going to get wrapped up in the meaningless stuff, your life is pointless. But if you're willing to go and spend time with those that are mourning, you become purposeful. You become of value. You get to... Love others. I don't want to be too morbid. But please live a life worth dying for. And when I say that, it's not I only live once. No, you live every day. You only die once. Make sure you die to yourself while you're alive so that you can be eternally with Christ. Carry on to the third one. Frustration is better than laughter. <laughs> Because a sad face is good for the heart. Now, the joy of the Lord is our strength. We read this. Um, it says then uh, in, in Psalms that God laughs at his enemies. The one in heaven derides. You know, laughs at the ones. It, it's, I love it. God wants us to have joy, but he's saying frustration is better than laughter because a sad face is good for the heart. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of the fool is in the house of pleasure. I went and checked stats. Some of the highest rates of suicides in, in, in professions is amongst comedians and creatives. It's crazy. The amount of comedians we've seen or we've heard about that have offed themselves, tragically. Guys like Robin Williams, one of the funniest men, he kills himself because frustration is better than laughter. Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn, they'll be comforted. I heard a brilliant saying recently. The only place that has sunshine every day is the desert. Sunshine every day causes the desert. We need rainy days. Let me use this as an example. Just in lockdown, the U.S. are coming out of it. There have been more patents for new inventions applied for. So there have been more applications to register patents in the U.S. in the last three months than there have been in the last three years, in totality. Frustration gave birth to innovation. And I think most inventions are birthed out of laziness and frustration. 
Uh, it, it's because we, we want to do something better and bigger and grander or faster or easier. That frustration gives birth to something. It's, I don't want to walk so I ride on a horse. I don't want my butt to get sore so I have a horse carriage. I want to go faster. There's a steam uh, engine, so we use that on tracks. Then we go into cars, then we go into bikes. And now it's, it's, it, this frustration can give birth to innovation. Frustration can also force us to look internally. If we're constantly trying to have this fake happiness, this false happiness, no one ever steps in and comforts you. Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn, they'll be comforted. People go, oh, no one's comforting me because you come into church with your mask on and I'm not talking about this thing that's trying to suffocate you. We come to church with masks of happiness and no one steps in to comfort you because... Only those who mourn will be comforted. There has to be something. You want to see something shift in your life, start being honest with the right people. Start speaking about what you're going through. Frustration is better than laughter because a sad face is good for the heart. That's what it says. So maybe sometimes we don't always have to be happy. That we can say to each other, actually I'm not doing well. It's good for the heart. The fourth one, verse 5. It is better to heed the rebuke of a wise person than to listen to the song of fools. So to heed, it's to listen to and respond accordingly. So it's better to listen to and respond accordingly to the challenge or the convicting speech of a wise person than to listen to the song of fools. Like the crackling of thorns, I'll explain that to you now. Like the crackling of thorns under the pot, so is the laughter of fools. This is meaningless. Extortion turns a wise person into a fool, and a bribe corrupts the heart. So pay attention to who's fueling your ego. They're movie stars. They're famous people that have the craziest requests. I went and checked out. I could not quote it. It's preposterous. They're movie stars that you've got to have certain things. They were famous. I'll give you this example. So Van Halen, the hardcore rockers, couldn't eat M&Ms that were brown. If there were brown M&Ms in the packet, they had to take them out. You see, too many people were telling them how awesome they were, so they start becoming fools. Movie stars, I can only have that color flower in the hotel. And, you know, Paul McCartney, if there's even a synthetic leopard print, it's going to kill an animal somewhere in the world. It's preposterous. Just be normal. But they've had too many fools cheer them on. So Van Halen can't have the brown M&Ms. Then the white M&M, the artist M&M, he insists on drinking water from some area in Poland. The guy grew up on the streets. Now all of a sudden, it's because someone's cheered him on. It speaks about the thorns crackling under the pot. In South Africa, we have this magnificent tumbleweed. And you can take this tumbleweed, and it's this big bush, and when it's nice and dry, you can see it kind of rolling over the dry areas in our country. And you can take that, and you put that on the fire, and it makes it it's majestic. It'll crackle, it'll pop, it's a rice crispy of fire making. It goes, it has these big flames, and within less than a minute, the flames are gone, and you have ash. That's what the praise of fools will do. It's all glorious in the moment, but will not feed you. If you're living a life for just people to praise you all the time, it's going to leave you with ash, nothing sustainable. There won't be a fire in your life. But when you have somebody who is wise and who cares about you, who's been through things, and often it's the older folk that challenge you on something. Now, nobody likes to be criticized. Nobody likes having their faults called out of them and say, the, but if we can take it, we're people that are wise. And you've got to be careful who you listen to. Um, I think it is John Wesley. I might be getting the person completely wrong. I'm sorry if I am. It's a good story regardless. But it was John Wesley, I believe, who had this woman attend one of his messages. And she sat there scowling at him the whole meeting. And after the meeting, she, he said to her, what seems to be the problem? She says, your bow tie it was skew. It was lopsided. It was hanging on the one side. He says, ma'am, I'm so sorry. Yes, I'm very, uh, it was a distraction. He says, hang on one second. And he, he ordered, ordered someone to get small shears, obviously a, a large pair of scissors. He said, ma'am, please correct me. And he gave her the scissors, and she, she took this bow tie that was hanging, and, even, and she trimmed it. He said, thank you so much, ma'am. May I do the same to you? And she looked at him and said, your tongue is bothering me. May I do the same? Now, I'm not saying we, we're that confident or aggressive. But in places where people can correct us, people that are wise, people that have experienced more. If you're in business, get an experienced businessman to speak to you. And he's going to tell you stuff that you're not going to enjoy hearing because we want to do the easy things. And he's going to tell you stuff. I love it when the older folk challenge me. 
you mustn't do that. And I'm not talking if it's just about style. Uh, the style is a different thing. I'm saying sometimes a person, and they could be younger than me but older in Christ, they can have wisdom. This is, I love this thing that uh, King David writes in Psalm 141 verse 5. Let a righteous man strike me. It is kindness. I want, a, I want a righteous man who walks with God. Punch me in the face. It's him showing kindness. Let him rebuke me. It's oil for my head. Let my head not refuse it. <laughs> it's oil on my head, but let my mind not refuse it. He's speaking about when Nathan the prophet challenged him, saying, you stuffed up, dude. You can't do that. And it challenged him, but it brought healing. There's some t- the instances where we're going to be challenged. I have incredible people in Lighthouse Church that when they've gone slightly off track, and some of you have gone way off track, and I've challenged people. And sometimes we get miffed with each other. And then people leave. And then they come back and they go, actually, uh, and it's not my opinions. It's, you know, obviously we'll just chat that as a leadership team. But, and then people are restored and they heal. That is the secret that we need to embrace to having a good life. This is not freedom to give, to have, you know, you to be critical. What it speaks of really is to have people in your life that are not just yes people. Not just this tumbleweed. Not these thorns that will make a big puff of fire but people that you trust, and you allow them to speak into your life. I have friends, and I say to them, so, what do you see? What am I doing wrong? I have pastors in my life that aren't in the church, that aren't local, that I say, this is what I'm going through. What do you see in my life? Speak into my life. It's kindness, that. It's tough, I know. The fifth one. The end of a matter is better than its beginning, and patience is better than pride. It's not how you start, it's how you finish. I'm sure you've heard that said. When it says patience is pride, is focus on getting the job done, as opposed to being the one done first. <laughs> I remember in high school, you finish exams, you get outside, and you finished first. I don't know what for, because you're only allowed to leave the property once everyone's done. And you finish the exam, and you sit there, because now you've won something, as, as if you're getting points for not finishing last. And it's funny, those that were always finished first never seem to be the first to go up and get certificates of achievement for academic merit. And you finish it first because there's something about getting it done. Getting the job done is important, but being patient in it and doing it properly is important as well. Focus on the end. How does it end? It's so much easier to do something properly than to go back and try and fix it. Raise your children well so that the police or advocates don't have to go back and fix them. Or schools have to try and fix them. Love people well. Love your wife well so the marriage counselor or divorce lawyer doesn't have to frighten you into going back to fixing it. Sometimes so much money, time, the total resources tapped into for the wedding is the focus. That's the start. Have you ever watched the start of an incredible race like the Comrades Marathon? I'm so sorry for the guys that don't get to run this year. But the... The start of the race, everyone's equal. You're there. You might be standing two kilometers back because, you, you know, that's where you place. <laughs> but you start as equals. It starts. You go. It's how you finish. I place all this emphasis. I'm getting married, and suddenly you're married, and then you've got to make it work. If you put as much emphasis every single day on married life as you did on the preparation to the wedding, you're going to be fine. If you woo and you love and you care every single day the way you did in preparation, the start, it's going to be fine. Don't get so wrapped up in how it starts. Get wrapped up in running it well so that you finish well. Going back to repair the mess is more frustrating than doing it slowly and getting it done properly. The sixth one. Oh, oh this is my tough one. I, can do, I think I can do the others moderately well. I'll hit the 15 to 20 percent of that. But this one, and my family's staring at me as I speak. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 9. See, the danger for me is I'm going to quote this and my wife is going to quote it back. Do not be quickly provoked in your spirit, for anger resides in the lap of fools. I'm not an angry person. I'm not an angry person. I don't make myself angry too often. And when it says about angers in the lap of fools, it's like it's there, don't touch it. It's there, it's waiting. 
it says in the New Testament, do not sin in your anger. So you're allowed to get cross for things. There's a Jesus, you know, he braids a whip and he, he, he sorts out uh, guys that are selling blemished animals in the temple. But when it speaks about this, do not be quickly provoked in your spirit. Whatever's in your spirit will come out as soon as you're provoked. And there's certain, so I have certain values, and I, I'm a highly opinionated person, and I understand opinions are like armpits. Everyone's got at least two, and uh, most of them stink. And I, so I have my opinions, and I have my, you know, we all, all have our preconceived prejudices, and often our prejudice is based on a set of values and morals that we hold dear to ourselves. And it was quite a while ago, and uh, Heidi and I had stopped at a filling station. It was late one night, and I could see the, the petrol attendant violently attacking a, a patron. The, the petrol attendant was hitting the patron, the guy that had just put fuel in his car with a brick. Uh, the guy that had just put fuel in the car, he had grabbed a bottle, he had broken it, and he, you know, he's trying to defend himself. But really, I could see that the aggressor was the petrol attendant. I didn't know what they were shouting at each other. It was in Zulu, and they cursing each other. So I step in to, to help the situation, and I, I stopped the fight. Um, and I just tell the guy, get in, you know, drop the bottle, we take the bottle off him, get him in the car, just, just leave, this is aggravating the situation, now get the petrol jockey to go back inside, stop the fight, because I hate bullies, the, the fact this guy was going to kill him with his brick, and uh, I get the guy in the car to leave, and I go back inside, feeling, now I've done something, the anger in me provoked me to respond, it's a good thing, I, in, the, in the moment I thought it was. Until the petrol attendant calmed down and said to me, no, that guy had just filled his car with fuel and he denied putting petrol in his car. I had gone inside. He had asked for a hundred rand. It was running. It was supposed to click off. He filled his tank and said, no, he hadn't asked for it. You just let the guy with a full tank of fuel drive away. So we had to wait a little bit longer so the police could get there and they got the guy's number plate and apparently was successful and they did retrieve the money because I had to give them my details because this meant that I had to have to go back to court and testify. If I'd slowed down just a little bit and asked better questions and just handled it differently. I'm not saying don't get involved. When you see there's people that are harming each other, if it's within your capacity to do something, do it. Phone someone. Do something. We're not spectators in life. But if I had allowed my anger not to be as quickly provoked to just step in. And it's, it, you know, in the mo I, mean, I can give you way worse examples of anger. I, I can give you exceptional examples that I don't want you to know about. Anger. I'm using one where it actually didn't work out well, where it, it, it seemed like a noble effort. Guard your heart when it comes to anger, how you respond to things. Do not be easily provoked. You're going to be provoked. You're going to be challenged. How you respond. I had to say to somebody this morning, I'm sorry, the way I responded to you, I was foolish. They go, well, don't be so foolish. I go, well, that's what the word says. Anger resides in the lap of fools. A fool picks it up. How do you respond to your children? Is this is anger or discipline. There's a difference. How do you respond to your husband? Is it an anger when he does something? Or is it, you know, maybe it's a frustration. You need to talk about some things. How are you responding to each other now that the lockdown's easing? How do we respond to our authorities? Please be careful. And then the last one. Do not say, this is verse 10. Do not say, why were the old days better than these? It's not wise to ask such questions. Stop living in the past. Stop living back then. The truth is your memory is not that great and your imagination is great. So what you remember it to be like is false. The emotion that you've attached to it, it's part of your imagination. Oh, the good old days. You know, remember. You'll hear old people or the elderly. You know, in my day I had a walk, blah, blah, blah. But then they'll tell you how good it is. So just go for a walk. I had to walk 10 k to school and it was in the snow and it was a blizzard and there was dogs chasing me and lions and I had to wrestle and Samson helped me. It's always the good old days. We are in the good old days. We're in the right season. We're in the right time. Getting the right job done if you're pursuing the purpose of Christ. Oh, back when we, the when we, I love the when we, when I was young or when I was there or when we lived there or when we. Now, Solomon says, stop trying to live in the past. Stop focusing on the past. That's not where you live. It's just unhealthy. These are seven things that if you apply to life, it starts changing your purpose. It starts changing your direction. It allows you to look further. You cannot look back and expect to walk into your preferred future that God has for you. 
There are moments when you look back because you want to reflect on, I made a poor decision or I will not do that again. That's safe. But you cannot look back and go, ah, those were the glory days. Because it might not be for someone else in your life that was living in the same time. We're living in a moment now. Make this moment count. Look into the future and go, patience, peace are these virtues that only the Holy Spirit can give. That we start living out our lives with a purpose of pursuing Jesus. It's not how you start, it's how you finish. But I need to ask you, did you start your relationship with Jesus? It doesn't matter what you've been through, have you started a relationship with Jesus? None of this counts. Life is meaningless without Christ. There's no purpose and there's no future. If you do not know Jesus, the saddest day of your life will be your death. And the life you have lived will be the highlight of your eternity. But in Christ, the highlight will be your eternity. And this moment, this temporary suffering on earth will be a, a breath. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for giving us seven key remedies of how to transform a meaningless life into one that is purposed to exalt you. If you're praying with me this morning and you've never given your life to Jesus, if you've never made a commitment to follow him, if it's you, perhaps you've been religious all your life, but you've never made a public or maybe a, a verbal confession of your faith, I want, you to, I want you to pray this with me. I'm going to have the words come up on the screen so that you can see and pray with intent. And it's about you giving your life to Jesus. And as you surrender to Him, you, He will patiently walk you through it. He doesn't expect this sudden transformation. He transforms you in an instant into a, a child of God. But He'll walk patiently this process with you. So would you pray this with me, me please? It's, if you just pray, Father God, Thank you for sending Jesus to die for me, to pay the price for my sins. Dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner, and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins, rose again from the dead. I turn from my sins and invite you to come into my heart, to come into my life. I want to trust you and follow you and serve you. I want to serve you as Lord and Savior. I ask you, God, to give me your Holy Spirit, to be filled by him and baptized in him, to make me a child of God. There is no other God but you. I surrender my all. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've prayed that prayer, please contact us. Please contact the office. Get hold of us on social media. We'd love to hear from you. Tell a friend that you've given your life to Jesus. It's the most important decision of your life. If you're not in Lighthouse Church, if you're not in the area, please get into a Bible-believing, spiritful church so that you can carry on growing into the likeness of Christ. We thank you so much for joining us today. But don't dial out yet. We have something really special planned for the kids and possibly the little kitty that still lurks somewhere inside there. Have a wonderful week. I just wanted to make this announcement, um, and it's more just a, an appreciation message. I want to thank every person that has given so generously and continued with their financial support of Lighthouse Church. We know that the Word tells us that the only way we don't rob God is when we tithe. But I also understand that sometimes people don't grasp this, or sometimes people don't embrace this reality, this truth. I want to say thank you to you. What we've been able to continue doing in this season, in a season that is potentially very, very dry, we know that God creates rivers and deserts. But let me share with you, and I can share this with you because we're family, but the rent is paid, the salaries are paid, and we have been able to give, it is now, I can say with confidence, hundreds of thousands in rands to those in need, the poor, the needy. We've been able to clothe people. We've been able to show that God is their provider through Christians being obedient to the Word of God. I just want to say thank you. Um, often as churches, and I speak generally now, we often invest a lot of time in trying to convince you to give or we spend a lot of time trying to coax you uh, to give. I just want to say thank you. 
You've made it an absolute pleasure to lead this church. It's an absolute privilege to be part of this wonderful team that's called Lighthouse Church. And I want to say thank you this morning. Um, it's, it sounds like a significant statement just to say thank you. But what you've been able to do, we don't advertise it. We don't make a big fuss about it. But I can say to you, the job is being done. We're getting things done. All honor, to, you know, all honor and glory to Jesus. But I want to thank you for your obedience. I trust that you'll have a blessed week. And I also pray a blessing over every one of you that's gone through an exceptionally difficult financial time. I pray that God will release the abundance of heaven over your finances. In Jesus' name. Have a wonderful week. God bless. Hey, boys and girls. Wow, it's so good to see you. We continue our series under God's construction. It's based on Psalm 127, verse 1. It says, If the Lord doesn't build a house, the work of the builders is useless. We're learning about building. And today, we're going to learn about Jericho and the walls. Let's go see the adventures of Fricky and Bob and myself. Let's get started. Hierdie ou gebou is in die pad. Een van die torens sal ons moet plaats slaan. Jylle weet wat sy tyd dit beteken, dus... Demolition time! Woehoe! So, we got to get it out the way? Ons moet het uit die pad uit al, ja. Frikkie, you love demolition. Yes, I do. I came in no, like a... No, 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 no. Okay, so your favorite way of demolishing things, Fricky, is? A wrecking ball, obviously. Wrecking ball? Hmm, okay. Do you? I've got a, I've got a, uh, I've got a, I've got a video about it. Do you really have a video? Yes. Let's watch it. Cool. Whoa. That's scary. Looks like fun. Mm. Reggie, what do you like to use? I like, I'm like Thor, I like the hammer. Whoa, watch this video. That's my favorite. Bob, wow. what's yours? Uh, mine is dynamite. Dynamite, that's wow. scary. We can't play with that. Nope. Come on, look at how this looks. Sounds clear. Three, two. One. Fire. Whoa! Wow! Look at the dust! It's everywhere! It, it's so dirty, it looks like Frookie's bedroom! That's wild. You know, it's like when things are in the way that shouldn't be there, we need to deal with it. It's, it's like in the Old Testament, in the book of Joshua, 
the Israelites, whoa, I gotta tell the story. Can I tell the story? Yeah, story time, please, Reggie. Yeah. So, here's the story of Joshua. So, first of all, let me introduce you to Joshua. This is Joshua. He was the leader of the Israelites after Moses had died. Joshua loved the people, and the people loved Joshua. And more importantly, Joshua loved God. And one day, after they had crossed the Jordan River, Joshua was sitting outside, and then suddenly a man appeared. And Joshua said, Who are you? And this man said, Hello, I'm the commander of the Lord of hosts. I'm the commander of God's army. Joshua said, Well, what do you want? And he said, Well, God has an instruction for you. You need to attack Jericho. Joshua went, Okay, how? And he said, What you must do is you must follow my instructions. Now, Jericho knew that the Israelites were there to attack them, and they were in full lockdown. Like we're in lockdown now, every door was shut and no one could go in or out. It was really difficult. And what the man explained to Joshua was, you would go and you would go and stand outside Jericho, and for six days you would march around Jericho. Every day you would march around quietly. And going with you would be the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of God. That means they would go with the presence of God. We must always go with the presence of God. And they went for six days and they had to march every single day once around the city. But on the seventh day, it was told to him, you will shout and cheer and the walls will come tumbling down. Joshua couldn't believe his ears. He said, how is it possible? But I trust God. And he said to the armies, practice your cheer. And everyone went, yay! And even Flicky went, mm. shame. And when they cheered, the walls came down. And everyone was so happy. No one even touched the walls, boys and girls. No one even put a hand to it. But they were obedient. And when they were obedient to God, God moved. And God broke down the walls. And God wants to break down the walls in your life. There may be challenges and you might have sadness and you might have problems in your life and you might have sin in your life and whatever is in your life. God wants to see those walls broken down. God wants to see everything that is in the way of you living out the purpose of your life. God wants to see those walls taken down. And that's what we learned from these walls being taken down. The walls of Jericho and Joshua and the children of God had victory. Hey Bob and Fricky. When God wants the wall down, he doesn't even need a wrecking ball. You see guys, when God deals with something, he deals with it much better than we ever could. It's wild. When we deal with things, we sometimes make more mess. Like with the wrecking ball, even dynamite, bricks. But God, when he deals with the things, no matter how big, small, impossible, Impossible it may seem. Impossible. Yeah. God's plan, God's ways are the best ways. Did you enjoy that? Yes, I loved it. That was an awesome story. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Reggie. And thank you, Jesus. Yes. Thank you, Lord. So, boys and girls, no matter what your problem is, no matter what you're facing, it could be problems at school, maybe you've been bullied, maybe you're worried. Trust God. Let God lead you. And He will break down the walls, no matter what they are. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus. See you guys next week. Bye. 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 Remember, kids. To wash your hands with soap and water, get the mask clean, and don't forget your face mask. Cause we're all under construction.